Hey, remember what I mentioned about the euro last time? Yeah, those channels are really wide. Not your typical stroll in the park. So when the asset gets in these wide channels, the key is to stick to the edges. Trying to fish in the middle? That's asking for trouble with all that wild volatility. Check out the H1 chart now. See those sudden spikes? That's the nasty volatility I'm talking about. Like at 1.087, not a single stop loss order would be able to make it. But look, there are some nice pictures over here. Check this out. There's a solid limit level right here on the H1 chart. Here it is. You can play around with it, but remember, the trading will be taking place within the channel. So, tread carefully, all right? At these strong levels where you can set a short stop loss order, that's where the real action is. Just keep your eyes peeled and be super cautious, okay? All right, let's talk about NSD. We've hit a seriously strong short zone right here. You see, within like 15 pips or so, you could, you know, maybe open some short positions because you can set a stop loss just behind that level. Yeah, so you got to see how it plays out from here, you know, before you're ready to head further down. But since the channel is super wide, we've entered this really solid short channel for NZD. Uh, if it holds here in this short channel, then we might be looking at a hefty move of like 200 pips toward the nearest border, JPY. I'll show it to you now. Those who are hanging out in my pro channel, please drop a plus sign. Today, it was all about JPY. And man, did it deliver. This is what we're talking about in the pro channel. This is homework from Pro Channel. Check out JPY. It played out beautifully. Yesterday's close, ideal. JPY went up a smooth 100 pips, looking sharp. Now, some of you might be wondering, especially if you haven't done your homework, like, how did you even think about going long on JPY after it dropped like 180, 200 pips? Hey, don't overlook one super crucial thing, all right? JPY has got a strong level. By the way, all these levels are in the system. I am not changing them. People in the pro channel can vouch for that. And here we have a very strong level. Check out what went down yesterday. Yesterday, you see, we closed the day right under the high. Now, here's Arthur asking a question. When you spot the asset closing under the high bar and right next to the level, chances are a big player is lurking there, not having fully accumulated their position. So, no need to be afraid of those paranormal bars. What really matters is getting the gist of it all. Take a peek at the 1H chart and you'll notice the asset inching closer here on those small bars. So, here's the scoop. See, it came up to this point and then it hit the brakes. What went down here? Just head over to the Gerchik.com page. There is access to the pro channel from there. Check out what happened. Remember that level I mentioned, 158.97. Take a good look. You see the asset shot up real quick, then its volatility calmed down, and it rolled back a bit. Basically, it's a signal that the asset is gearing up for the next move. Pay close attention. This is like a close retest already. Once it hits that far retest, the next stop's gonna be a near one. So you might have heard bits and pieces here and there, but you don't quite have the whole picture. That's why it's crucial to understand that the H1 chart was quite beautiful. See? We pushed through smoothly with no major pullback. And then we went on to tackle the next high. Now, take a really good look at what went down next. You see, I marked the level on the left side, not the right. That was a high. Those were bars in relation to a false breakout. And check it out. We bounced right back from that exact level. Look, let's go to the 1H chart and you will see that a stop occurred exactly at this level. This means the level was drawn correctly. Now we have to see how it behaves today. Let's take a closer look at a weekly chart. If we break out a weekly chart now, let's look at the monthly one. All right, check it out. If we pull up the monthly chart for the Japanese currency right now, it's like fireworks going off. So we got to keep an eye on how the asset behaves. Its level is at 151.70. You could even mark it clearly at 151.72. And if the asset closes right around this level, then we could be looking at further continuation. You saw it, right? The weekly chart and month are empty. Japan is trying to tackle the currency depreciation issue, but they're not succeeding exactly, just like the Turkish lira, that's struggling too. It's like there's just nothing you can do sometimes. 
It's just that, you know, the national currency is taking a beating. Why do I keep bringing up the Turkish lira? Because you can't just sit back and watch those interventions happen all the time. Any stop loss you set will just get thrown out, yeah. And just sitting there hoping it'll hit 40 Turkish lira? Sure, it might hit 40, but you must be seriously optimistic. All right, let me break it down for you about the rate hike in Japan. Honestly, it's not a huge deal. I'll tell you why in plain terms. The Japanese currency has been depreciating for ages. Just take a peek at the monthly chart, and you'll notice that since 2022, even with no rate hikes, the Japanese currency has been losing value, and it's depreciating again. So the rates here aren't really in play. This is just a sudden, out-of-the-blue move in the lira. This country is basically clinging on to its national currency and resorting to what they call interventions. The Japanese yen has been intervened with several times. Go ahead, hop on the internet, read up on interventions, and you'll get it. They've tried intervening with the Japanese yen a bunch of times. Unfortunately, it doesn't do much. Sure, it might help momentarily, but given the economic conditions, it's pretty much ineffective. You see, I haven't even touched the Australian dollar. It's still stuck in the same range, no need to mess with it. And check this out, there's quite a difference. NZD has already plunged into a super strong short channel, but AUD is still hanging in there. All right, let's keep it moving. The Swiss franc was also on the long side, you see. It's starting to make moves today on the 20th. Today, I was all about the Swiss franc, and it delivered. All right, moving on. I didn't have GBP either. It's stuck in a super wide channel. So let's keep things rolling. I didn't add the Canadian dollar either. As for oil, well, unfortunately, it was on my long list today but it didn't quite pick up steam, you know. Oil actually closed pretty solidly yesterday. Keep an eye on this channel. Oil's got a strong level at 86.62. Pay close attention. If oil can enter this channel, we might see some sharp movements. Now let's talk about Ethereum and BTC. Listen, I recently posted a video that breaks it all down on TradingView. Check out the video on Instagram too. It's got all the details on what could go down with Bitcoin. Here's Bitcoin at its level. The volatility is through the roof right now. Seriously, if you're not sure how to handle high volatility, take a look at the 1H chart and see for yourself. Yeah, on the 1H chart, the volatility is pretty normal. Now that you've got specific levels and know how to navigate, that's the key. You see, they bounced back. One entered its long zone, and the other bounced back into its long zone too. The volatility is sky high. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of that kind of volatility. I prefer it when I can clearly spot the levels, watch how the asset moves, and just observe what unfolds. All right, let's keep it moving. Now, on to silver. Silver is just hanging out there. Not much action happening with silver. And gold? Well, same deal. People often ask about gold. What's there to see, right? You've got one level here, another there, and a whole channel. In other words, gold is currently cruising in a pretty wide channel. You see, it hasn't even touched the channel boundaries yet. So that's the deal with gold. No need to overthink it. Now, here's a question for you. You claim all indicators are nonsense, right? Yeah, I agree. Why are there so many of them then? All these indicators were created back in the 80s and 90s. Back then, the market wasn't as efficient as it is now. Sure, some might work here and there. But let me tell you why I can confidently say they're all nonsense. Back in 2011, when I was the director of global markets at Finum, I had three top-notch programmers on my team. We programmed every single indicator out there. Every single one. Fibonacci, levels to GAN angles, triangles, you name it. We covered the whole shebang. But here's the kicker. None of them worked perfectly. You had to sift through a mountain of data just to find something that kind of worked. There's just no pressure in gold. None at all. We tried out countless indicators. Sure, maybe one or two worked on a specific chart snippet. But in the long run, nope, nada. I was just curious, you know. So, George Soros says technical analysis is a bust on the stock market. But hey, let George Soros do his thing. Warren Buffett's not into it either. These guys, they're investors. About as close to investors as to the moon and back. We're talking about people who sit in the same boat as me. What George Soros is saying now is that technical analysis is a dead end. But guess what? I've made all my dough from technical analysis. I stick to trading solely based on technical analysis. Sure, I might not be rolling in dough like George Soros or Warren Buffett, but the money I make keeps me comfy, 
So if I were you, I wouldn't even bother with indicators. Don't waste your time. Because trust me, it's a dead-end road, a total misconception. And if you spend a ton of time studying them, you'll just end up disappointed. There's nothing better than price as an indicator. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Levels and price. That's all you need to focus on. How they approach, the speed they're coming at, accumulation, and all that jazz. If you check out my Instagram, you won't find any holy grail in trading. There's only one thing that matters, and that's understanding the charts. Take a close look. Head over to my Instagram, and you'll see the latest 20 recommendations. I nailed it with 17 out of 20 recommendations. That's a solid 70-80% success rate. So, I'm just showing you the signals I dish out. They're on the Telegram channel every day. Yeah, the Telegram channel is a paid one. But hey, I still throw out some stuff for free. All right, moving on to the S&P. The S&P is on my radar for long positions. I'm really digging the S&P. I don't think we're quite ready for a correction yet. I won't jump in before hitting that level. There's still a ton of strong accumulation going on, and it's looking pretty darn good. Maybe today. They'll wait to see what the Federal Reserve has to say. Let's wait and see. But as of now, the s and is looking pretty sweet. Now, about those glasses with volume, let me break it down for you. I used to look at them back when someone mentioned the ticker tape. At one point, I knew the tape better than anyone because I used both the tape and the glass, but I ditched them ages ago. Back in 2008, even at our Tula office, we ditched the tape and glasses for one simple reason. There's a ton of orders happening outside the exchange. And then came the robots and dark pools. And let me tell you, those robots often throw in fake orders. The big ones are the market makers. Take Lime Brokerage, for example. Out of their 250 trading days, 237 were in the green. They're constantly throwing in these misleading orders, and you end up falling for them. A huge chunk of money's flowing through dark pools nowadays. So you won't get the real picture from the glasses or the volumes. Stick to those sloping lines. They're always there. It's a 50-50 win rate. But those slanted lines, nope, they don't work. Let me explain why, because you can't really formalize slanted lines. And let me give you an example, just like you mentioned, slanted lines. Allow me to illustrate with an example of a slanted line. Check out this slanted line. Take a good look. By the time the asset reaches this point, you'll already be eyeing the entry spot. First off, you're going to enter when the slanted line is broken out. You'll find yourself quite a distance away from the stop loss. And that's a major issue. See, I know all about slanted lines, and I can break down why they just don't cut it. So, let's say you're entering the SMP. You'll have to enter somewhere around here, or maybe here. But if, heaven forbid, this level dips lower because someone starts making moves, let's clean the slate and draw another slanted line. We'll start it from here this time, for instance, because everyone's got their own idea of where to draw those slanted lines, you know? See? Someone might start it from here and bring it all the way over here. And that's not right, because that's stretching it too far. Then you'll have to tuck the stop loss over here. And that's the problem with slanted lines. I could debate with you about anything under the sun. And here's why. Right now, we're not talking about win rates. We're talking about the risk-reward ratio. Get it? Understanding the risk-reward ratio is crucial. Some things solely depend on what it shows. All right, let me address Caroline's question. I was watching an interview yesterday where the guest was trading Elliott Waves live and analyzing a coin. And guess what? It worked out. Caroline, I did a live analysis of the March 7 coin on Pro Blockchain. You guys can check it out. It hit 100%. Let me break it down again. We're talking about hitting one or two out of 10. I've got an 80% win rate. On March 7, there's a video on Pro Blockchain where I showcase the coin and it hit an 80% success rate. And here's the thing, I didn't just talk about it, I showed the prices, how much to buy, the whole shebang. Sure, sometimes people nail it with horoscopes too, but we're talking about someone actually doing all this work. Now here's the problem with Elliott Waves, they're open to interpretation. Give me five traders, and each one will interpret those waves differently, just like Fibonacci levels. 
and chances are someone might not tell you the whole truth. They might have their own blend of techniques. But everything I show you, I lay it all out in detail. No secrets. You're not my competition. And often, traders use a mix of techniques. I've got a student who's all about Fibonacci levels and my levels. What does that mean? Well, if the Fibonacci level lines up with the Gerchik's level, I'm there. So, while Fibonacci levels might do the heavy lifting when they align with our levels, since all traders see it, there's an opportunity. Let's keep going. PLN didn't go anywhere. Your cat didn't budge. I didn't catch GBP NZD. GBP JPY slipped through my fingers. Moving on. Your CHF didn't make a move. GBPO didn't pan out. Your JPY. Do you see? Everyone pay attention. Today, I'm just laying out the win rate for you. Let me show you. One, two, three, four. Out of six recommendations, four hit the mark and two didn't pan out. They just didn't move. Check it out here. Consider that a win rate of 70%. The entry points were spot on. Ideal. That's your win rate. The only hiccup was with oil, but it didn't offer a clear entry point. And the S&P hasn't kicked into gear yet. Neither has Tesla. Speaking of Tesla, I said right away that it will be killed. I said it would tank to $160 right here. I made it clear from the get-go. If Tesla dips, it'll hit $160, exactly $160. Take a good look. It's crucial to grasp that if Tesla rebounds, it's just a normal bounce after a hefty drop. I even made a video. It's floating around the internet. Check it out. I mentioned that if Tesla breaks out 180, 185, it's in trouble. So what's my approach? I'm not trying to sound overly clever. Yesterday, I showcased that NVIDIA and Meta aren't showing signs of a downturn. Pay attention. Everything I do is straightforward. I go through each asset like this until I find one I understand at a deep level. That's key. For instance, Novavax was on my radar. Let me give you an example. Look, here's a level. Got it? That's my process. I set an alert for every asset I'm keen on. See here? Set alert. And for each asset, each set alert has an alert too. I've got alerts set up all over the place. So even if an instrument rebounds, say to $180, I won't touch it until it enters the long zone because the volatility there is insane. With that kind of volatility, all trades will terminate based on the stop loss order. So SPY is slowly getting its groove on. That's it. I'll bide my time.